Hello, and welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast on the internet that has both the science and the screaming to determine what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That year in question, right now, in the hot seat, strapped in, fucking car battery below it, <laughs> like jumper cables attached to its nuts, say, you better tell us the information we need, movie year, is 1984. We are going through it, we're turning around the bend, we're uh, watching movies as fast as we can, and tonight's movie is, of course, Stop Making Sense, a film without really a screenplay or a narrative. This is going to be the ultimate test for the panelists, and I hope that our producers got us good ones. Let's see. Let's open the doors up. Behind door number one, we have... Oh, Craig is here. Hey! Yeah, Craig's here. It's me. I, didn't, I have not started making sense, so I'm way ahead of the game, Ryan. Excellent work, Greg. Um, should we? Who do you? Who are you hoping is behind door number two? Uh, I am hoping it is somebody with expertise in music, um, somebody with a fresh perspective, somebody we haven't heard a lot from, uh, and somebody who is just dumb as a bag of, of doorknobs. Just somebody who is just such a pushover. I could just not even sweat winning this one. We have half of that. It's Mike. He, he listed like three things, so I'd say he, we have a third of that. <laughs> We have a third of that. We have just Half, the doorknob part. I'm, yeah, I'm dumb as a doorknob, and I'm into music, but I'm not a fresh perspective or nor an expert of music. So one and a half of the three things. Well, you're an expert at getting points on this show. If you don't know what that means, let me explain. This show is, of course, half movie analyst podcast, half game show. Mike and Greg tonight will compete to see who can get the most amount of points Arr. for talking good about Stop Making Sense, for complimenting what? me, for being uh, mean to each other. I like that. Hey, Greg. Um, I kind of already started that, right? That's true. Yeah. You stink hey, like Mike. ball dogs. And we have points. Fuck off, <laughs> Mike. I don't know why they turn into you're not 1930s New Yorkers when they insult each other. You're not a serious person. Oh. Ow. Hey. <laughs> hey. We say a lot of hurtful things on this show, but we never. There's lines. <laughs> Uh, Mike, I have a question for you. The producers of this show, the board, if you uh, will, have done an excellent job getting us guests across the field of movie critics, mm. celebrities, mm. all season long. And yet this, this is the episode where they said, mm, no guest, they can handle that film that is about music and there's no script. Yeah, I, I think they thought we were joking when we let this one slide through for years. And we don't like to air our dirty laundry. We don't like to show a little leg. Uh, for years, we've avoided documentaries because we said, wouldn't that be too difficult? So let's tackle this non-narrative <laughs> film that, that has all music. A rockumentary. A rockumentary, yeah. if you will. Uh, so they thought we were joking, so they just like rested. They did nothing. They, they said, oh, is that my laurel? I'll take a little nap right on it. And Oh, what are these, some laurels? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to rest right on these bad boys. As the Bible said, on the seventh episode of the season, you rest. And that <laughs> is what they did. Uh, Mike, I want to get to you in a second because you went to the theaters for this, and I want to talk all about that. So, Greg, what was your Stop Making Sense experience this week? I uh, Historically, I have never I had never seen this movie, but I've heard about it a lot. But uh, the Talking Heads were a big band played in my, my house. Uh, my dad, like, Saturday mornings would put on. So I've heard basically all of these songs. Some of them I didn't even realize were the Talking Heads. Yeah. Uh, but I've heard them all throughout my childhood. But I had never seen this movie, uh, and I heard a lot about it, and I was like, how could, I mean, how could it live up to what everybody says? And it really, it does. It's a good, it's a good concert. It's uh, a good movie. It, I feel like we, it's a it's a tall order for us. I feel like because we don't we like to crack these open and get all into the, like the real the meat on the inside, uh, and I think it might put up a little bit more of a fight than your average movie because I don't know that there is as, you know, the same amount of depth to this as there is to like um, Ghostbusters. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, that's gonna get us emails. Um, I I don't know if I've ever heard anyone say I finally watched it and it didn't live up to all the hype. Yeah. You know, it is that undeniable of a movie. Uh, Mike, you, this was for the 40th anniversary a couple months ago. It was re-released in theaters yeah. with all new sound. 
Um, yeah, different band songs. I heard a lot that of was weird. Went to see it in the theater. Talk about this. Different. Yeah, different music. <laughs> All new sound. <laughs> They're just like slide whistles and shit. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> a lot of dialogue. Um, what was it like? How, was that the first time you had seen it? And what was the experience? Like? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll start there, and then if because when else can I do it? Just talk about me and the Talking Heads in general. But yeah, it was. Uh, I went to a little art house theater here that that does a lot of cool stuff, and they were playing it and packed theater and it's one of the boozy theaters and my wife and i were the youngest people by far and people clapping (laughs) after songs ended people started dancing like saying it was a fucking blast and uh i'm of the age and i'm sure we talked about this like eyes just moisten for no reason and yeah it was just it it was (laughs) it's so i've had that the opposite at live shows where you get emotional because how good it is but i don't know if i've ever had that I did not expect a concert film to be able to do that to me, uh, and it was a blast. And it, I think it helps. It feels like it had a concert feel. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, because everybody reacting. And at first, uh, my wife was just like, why are they clapping? I was like, fuck you. I'm clapping, too. This is great. Like, let's let's <laughs> enjoy it and pretend it's real, because why not? I think there should we should be more supportive of people who want to clap. When the plane lands... You know what? You didn't fall out of the sky. If people want to clap because the plane landed, let people clap I'll, if they want to. The movie's over. Yeah. I know nobody who made the movie is there. That's okay. I like clapping. I'm clapping it's for fun. the projectionist. Thank you for splicing all that film yes. together so well. That was centered. I love uh-huh. that. You got that right on. You hit those screen. dicks. Just one of the healthiest ways of projecting. And I, I, I've never thought to clap at the end of a movie or when a plane lands. But How about so, after sex? You ever just like... Well, you know I do yeah. golf claps. No one can hear my claps because of everybody else clapping. <laughs> um, but to be to be get angry that other people are clapping is that is such a choice not, to just be like not angry, you fucking Conf- moron, confused. Oh, other people. Okay, I was trying to say uh, to defend my lovely wife. Not uh, <laughs> more, more confusion not Mike's than anger. Robot than wife, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was. I think why it was so emotional, and then like this is this has become. So I saw it once in theaters six months ago, and then again now, and uh, this could be quarterly i was gonna say annual not enough i could watch this quarterly and not get bored what a so often it's hard to watch narrative movies without your phone in your hand and it's wild how at no point this week while i was watching it was like what is the internet up to i don't give a shit because i'm watching at Burn no Co. point no you I fucking I, this is you just sat, you just sat there completely transfixed the entire this time. is one of i and it's hard to say because only thing that this is one of my favorite movies now and i fucking love this and I've, at the last few years this is one of my favorite bands i i knew that the hits the burning down the house once in a lifetime psycho killer like you hear those as a kid and in the last f- four or five years gotten heavily into them great and uh it's it's phenomenal no yeah i am transfixed by this in a way i'm not by so many other movies I watched the movie with my phone in my hand the whole time, but just because I was filming the concert, because that's how I watch concerts. I now. was watching my, I was watching it on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I, um, I am excited for this. I do think that it will be uh, one of our biggest challenges, not just for the show, but in our lives. Yes. We are fucking sheltered little weenies, mm-hmm. and we don't have a mm-hmm. lot of hardships. Mm-hmm. But let's take a break, and when we come back, stop making sense. Shot over four nights at the Pantages Theater, three of those nights with a live audience, Jonathan Demme's Stop Making Sense is a Talking Heads concert film with a little bit of David Byrne's solo work and the Tom Tom Club sprinkled in for good measure. How the Talking Heads were able to get David Byrne in the Tom Tom Club, I'll never know. (laughs) The movie starts with David Byrne alone on the stage singing Psycho Killer. Bassist Tina Wymouth comes out for Heaven. Drummer Chris France, a.k.a. Mr. Wymouth, comes out for Thank You for Sending Me an Angel. And guitarist Jerry Harrison comes out for Found a Job. This is such an incredible way to start a show. You wonder why more people don't do it. Wait, hold on. I came in, and then I introduced Greg, (laughs) and then I introduced Mike. And so making this episode as good as the film Stop Making Sense. Once the band is out, they're joined by singers and dancers Lynn Mabry and Edna Holt, keyboardist Bernie Worrell, drummer Steve Scales, and scene-stealing guitarist Alex Weir. Over the course of 16 songs, 93 minutes, and one big-ass suit, Demi and the Heads created what went on to be known as one of, if not the greatest concert films of all time. Taste Buds, I ask you this. We spent so much time on the show discussing story and character. 
did watching this movie specifically for the show make you have to rethink how you talk about a movie? Did you have to break down your rubric to the basics? Or was this an easy movie to think about along the lines of Vertigo, The Seven Samurai, and The Seventh Seal, and The Seven Vertigos? <laughs> for me, <laughs> it, I, I did not change my approach to, to the movies at all. I just put, I pressed play and I watched it and let it wash right over me. Great. Now I'm wondering if maybe I should have. <laughs> Frank sat I down like he always does. Arms folded saying, how will I be offended this Mike. week, movie? <laughs> <laughs> Show me your sexism and or racism, movie, <laughs> so that I might shake my head and say there must be a better way. It's funny because uh, to pull back a little bit the curtain... Um, we are going to, I just want, right now I want to talk about the show as a whole, like the concert. And then later on in the show, we're going to talk about David Byrne and then Jonathan Demi. And that's almost how, like what happens when you watch it three times. Yes. You, know, yeah. you have to watch it this amount of times in order to sort of get all of the levels that this is so different than anything else that has come before or since it. But the thing that it, it definitely does not fail to do is captivate you from the jump. Mm-hmm. Um, and it it like makes a case for itself right away and without any effort you're you are absolutely Great. pulled in uh you don't have to have anything explained to you you don't you're like not worried that you're not going to enjoy it right away you are off to the races and he does explain to you he has a tape he wants to play and then he starts singing <laughs> but like i think just like it is so every other concert film i've ever seen and maybe there's other ones that look this bare bone but when he begins you see Roadies and stage crews Mike. to the side. You see, like, the skeletal you see the back, back stage. Area. <laughs> and it's just, like, and lit with, like, normal fucking, like, Home Depot hanging bulbs. And, st- like, it's so not uh, showmanship at first that it's subtly, like, it really, you're like, okay, we're going to be real and intimate. And then it hooks you and be like, this has all been an art project, you dumb Mike. viewer. Uh, which I really enjoyed, like. I think RISD kids should be behind every concert film because that's going to make it way more entertaining than just like, okay, now a guitar solo. Really get in there on his mouth going, wow, 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 as his hands do. <laughs> well, it's funny because I think that the idea behind what you're saying, and a lot of the stand-up movies that we grew up with too, would have to show mm-hmm. the audience in line for the ticket yeah. and the, the star backstage. Or you get a, a, little, a little skit. Yes, uh, which is someone oh. very funny who you, who you respect a lot doing something that is completely unfunny that you are like fast forwarding yeah. as quickly as you can. They hired the rappers of the '90s who wrote those <laughs> skits to write these skits. Yes, <laughs> they had no time uh, to write that skit, no thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and like, I think part of the idea of that is people go and see shows, but they don't get all of this backstage stuff. So like, this is almost special yeah. features involved in our movie. Mm-hmm. And what this movie does is it says nobody is going to get to see this show, you know, like right. aside from these thousand people ever in the history of time, they're not going to see this show. So let's make them make the people who watch this movie feel like they were at the show and therefore like at a better version of the show because we get all of the angles and everything. Right. And watching the stage be built, like not only do they invite different like musicians on, but you watch the whole stage be assembled. And I think that like at the opening shot, were the entire band and them on stage, it would feel thin or empty. But to watch it like slowly be assembled makes it feel all the fuller, all the more like impactful. And Greg. And what what I love is so it's clearly and it always has been if you're into the talking heads, David Byrne and the Talking Heads. Everybody's very talented, but it's impossible to not separate them. And I know we're gonna talk about him alone later. But what adding one member at a time does for for dum dums who don't know how music works necessarily, they let you focus mm. and go. Oh, this is what Tina on the bass adds. This is what Chris yes, on the drums yeah. adds. Like, and it really more than I love that at the end of the show. It's it's in the penultimate song. He finally says, "Hey, here's who the band is." Uh, Mike, and that's so reversed because the whole time there's so much thought into like, here's what a show does. Here's how we're fucking with it. And by adding that one member at a time, that is actually highlighting them more than doing a solo. That goes on for too long and nobody cares about. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'm really not using this excuse highlight... to dig at every other yeah. band ever. <laughs> you hate solos. Uh, not only does it uh, let us know what uh, just Tina and David sound like, right? Because I do think that a lot of people lose the bass when they're hearing a song. 
but it mm-hmm. also gives us their personality and we get to see just what a fucking delightful time and seemingly delightful life tina is having and yes. then each person yeah. comes up we get to focus on them and also when we get that uh, on the fifth song or maybe it takes to the like the sixth or seventh song when we get all nine people out there it's so impactful because of what we've been through as opposed to if it started like that we'd be like yeah. oh yeah that's what a show looks like that's that's them yeah exactly so, right, you yeah know? um you mike you said you get to see what everybody brings what what does the drummer add to this band oh he that's right <laughs> he brings a norm core vibe which I think elevates <laughs> how artistic and intellectual everybody else is. Is is this guy, am I correct in reading this, that before every song he listens to the beat that he's supposed to play on his little headphones before he starts playing? Every song starts with him, like he's got a headphone up to his ear and he's listening and then you can see him saying to himself what the beat is and then he starts playing Oh, it's rock a doom rock a doom 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 <laughs> drum, 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 drum. <laughs> Before the before the Tom Tom Club, he just listened to a, a, a song just going. Oh, should I just scream James Brown for a while? I'll just, I'll just say weird stuff. Okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> yes, but all together, um, they do make an incredible band. I would say the Talking Heads. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> inarguable. Uh, do good. you, re- Ryan? Do you remember and- in Rock Band uh, that when you would play the drums for the song "Psycho Killer" and you're literally playing the drums? Like, yeah. that's the only one where they don't break it down. They're just like, no, you just this is how you play the drums for this song. <laughs> Actually, we had to juice it up for the yeah. video game because <laughs> he added some notes. Well, what I love about this as a concert film is because there is there's the core four and then five additional right ex- extenders of the band and the film if you didn't know about the talking heads and you didn't go watch them this film these are all other than burn being front and center they the demi treats them equally and they each get their moments to shine and i think that's the coolest way because i've seen bands like green day where there's a third guitarist in the back and like the spotlight never goes <laughs> on him and you're like well motherfuckers he's on stage <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, the camera loves all these people, and they seem to love their Mike. jobs. And I think that's so yes. that's such a big part of what makes it infectious is that, and, like, I said the word undeniable before, and I will probably use it again because I don't think that you come away from this not being a huge Talking Heads fan. And it's because they are up there, like, creating something with the biggest smiles. Everything that's choreographed is almost feels like it's not. Sometimes it feels like they right. they, it, they just had to it was bursting out of them, you know? And I've been to so many shows that feel like this is the 99th out of 370 shows of this tour, yeah. you know? <laughs> and they're just going through the motions and the music sounds great, but usually I'm so far away, I don't even notice how fucking bored they are with this. <laughs> I'm on the stage. And I got a special invite, and I am smiling as much as they are for the entire time. It's like you're the lamp. <laughs> you got pulled up on if the only just, I could be. I love how just like, being when you hugged in his epic... weird, awkward arms. <laughs> when you think of like big epic concerts, you think of like crazy like laser light shows or like big props or whatever. I love how for this one, it's like a lamp, a bigger mm-hmm. than average suit. <laughs> right. a video board that sometimes says things yeah and it feels a little like 80s new york art museum at times you oh, know yeah. like the modern art shit that you would see mixed media um but also because there isn't a big dragon that comes out uh a la shows from today <laughs> um like phantasmic is the only mm-hmm, concert i've mm-hmm, ever been to yeah um that it makes every single little thing that they do that much more impactful again impact it's just so much impact and I think but they, by they stripping things any, down. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because they don't rely on any cheap tricks because they are so engrossing. Like I mean, that they there is such a uh it, it, like a a energy to them just standing there playing the the bass player is the perfect example because she comes on and she hardly moves at first, but then you watch her over the entire uh show get more and more into it until she's like dancing a ton. And that's just like a, a cool energy to watch her sort of like, I don't know, give herself over to it over time. And I, I think because David Burns' uh, girlfriend at the time helped choreograph it because she, she was the dancer and 
it's so stripped down. Each little moment suddenly is more important. Then if there were flames everywhere, who cares what face anybody's making? But because right. it's so stripped down, we're staring at everything. And the whole thing is a deconstruction. It's like, no, no, no. Here's how a stage is built. Isn't that neat? Look at the crew. Isn't that neat? Look. Oh, you see other bands jump in rhythm? You're watching us do it. And even our backup singers are doing air guitar, making fun of other bands. Like, the whole thing is <laughs> we love this, and it's fucking stupid at the same time. And it's fucking stupid. Uh, like, 10 years from now, guys, you're going to watch this band called Sum 41, and they're going to look so stupid compared to us. And you're going to wish their mom <laughs> had an abortion. <laughs> That's just a simple abortion, fact. Abortion. 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 abortion, abortion. Uh, that was the concert of the concert film later. We're going to get to the film of the concert film. But before that, we have to. We absolutely have to talk about the sexiest beefcakes of 1984. Mount Rushmore. That's right. It is Mount Rushmore time, and we have to. We have to dig in to the studliness of 1984. Mike, what does like your classic 84 guy look like? I I think you're like there's the very mainstream guy, which is like pit, slight pinstripe suit, like slicked back hair. But that's not a hot guy. Tommy I, Gun. Tommy <laughs> Green Gun. Green face. Uh, but but I, somebody stop needs to I, stop him. I think it's gonna lean gender bendery. Uh, it's gonna be you know not not a cartoon of abs like still hot and still bodies we'd never have, but more you can actually see some flab on top of the muscle. Oh God, that would be the dream. Uh, <laughs> Greg, who has to be on this? Who has to be on it? So you're asking me for my first yes. person. Yes. Uh, from from the from oh, and before you answer, Greg, uh, as everybody knows. If you say the one that I really need you to say, that will be worth bonus points, of course. Yes. Um, I was very struck by recently we had a uh, guest on, Melinda Clark and her daughter, CG, and um, we watched uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom together. And I was struck by how attractive Harrison Ford was. But uh, CG pointed out that when he is evil, <laughs> that is when he is <laughs> definitely hotter because he, quote, might kill me, unquote. Uh, but... He got it in really good shape for Temple of Doom, but he got an 84 shape, which I think I'm just partial to, which is not like the complete cut defined yeah. look, but like obviously powerful, strong, good, strong core, but without like the shredded abs. Uh, nice little tough to chest hair. I uh, honestly like almost as hot as you get in 84, I think, Harrison Ford. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe how much of that, even though, you know, that episode was 40% female how much we talked about how hot he was in that movie like this is a guy who everyone finds attractive in every movie yeah and yet this is that was the one mm -hmm. yeah I, he really did it up glistening uh great pick mike what do you got uh i think uh the king of sex especially in 84 when purple ring mike comes i out, was only three it's <laughs> good lord <laughs> it's prince oh oh uh, that's embarrassing and greg you're no embarrassing prince. for mike that he didn't say greg <laughs> yeah, we didn't have uh, – his movie did not make the Sweet 16, to I think a lot of our shock, but um, that doesn't mean that he can't win this shit. Kind of feels like Taylor made for him, right? Okay, Greg, what's next? Okay, let's see. Man, we're just burning through nap time. Uh, I another, – another reason for the season, Ryan, this is definitely underlining the boys in Hot Boys. But Repo Man, Emilio Estevez. Yes. Uh, Mike, you talked about the gender bendery stuff. He's got the the earring, right? Um, he's not like a super masculine figure, but he's got like those like puppy dog eyes. He's got that like I could fix this guy. Um, very very attractive quality, and like you know, giving the finger to the man, which is very cool too. Give that finger to me if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Brian. Uh, <laughs> I was doing some brainstorming for this segment with my wife last night and found out, and we have been married for 64 years this Monday, <laughs> um, did not know how hot that she and all other people like her th think Emilio Estevez is. Oh, really? Really? This guy's got beautiful eyes and eyelashes, yeah. She said it, and I quote, he's babelicious. He's babelicious. He really is. And very much like a, in a hot boy phase at this point, right? He's like such a tender little guy for being a punk. Yeah. He's like so soft. Ooh, and, and that's the best kind, a tender little punk? Yeah. <laughs> the tender punks. Best kind for what? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Exactly. 
All right, I want to put somebody on the mountain yet, but Mike, why don't you give me one more before I make my first selection? This is the exact opposite of what we've been saying. We've been saying gender bender. Esteban is Emilio? Not mask. Uh, I want leather. I want muscles. I want big. It's Arnold because Terminator is a sex spot, my friends. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, when he ran for governor, we found out that he was a little bit too much of a sex bot. <laughs> Remember that? Like, <laughs> when he ran for governor, within like a couple of days, like 18 women were like, this guy groped me a lot. Yeah. And found out that. S- secret son? Yes. Yeah, secret. <laughs> <laughs> there is a kid with his exact head. His exact head. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> there are some secret sons where you're like, oh, really? That's a secret son? <laughs> when you saw this secret son, you're like, oh, yeah, obviously. That's not even a secret. That's just yeah. a little Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's secret son the way animal style is the secret menu at in and out Everybody <laughs> fucking knows. <laughs> his name is like Juan Gonzalez. And he's like, hey, Juan, how are you? He's like, I'm doing good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You making yourself a salad? Yes, get to the chopper. <laughs> Great. Please hand me the chopper. Do it now. Oh, gosh. You're going to add some turmeric to that? It's not turmeric. Greg. Greg, <laughs> stop. You're going to win the game in the second segment. Um, <laughs> last night, talking to my wife, she also brought up something that um, she says every time I talk to the Hot Boys segment with her, when I brought up Arnold, she was like, men have no idea what women find attractive. <laughs> no, yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a man that men find attractive. And not like even in a gay way. Just like in a that's what we want. A big beefy physique. Either to hold on to or to be or something. But like no woman has ever looked at Arnold Schwarzenegger and been like, Oh yeah, that guy's really hot. Yeah, and the reason that we all aspire to it is so other men will think we're hot. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what if a boy noticed you? The dream. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Great. That point is going to Greg because I think that last week when we talked about Indy, I realized that he's taking this whole fucking thing down. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Greg. Who do you got? This is not one I knew until this week, but David Byrne. Holy moly, is David Byrne super duper hot? I know we're going to talk about his contribution to the to this show in particular soon, uh, but man, like he's got some sort of like energy it's, that just reaches right through the screen and grabs you it's in control of his awkwardness like it, it, mm. it's never uh, a hair out of place that he's not aware of and also the way he's dancing moving i never put it together Mike. he looks like killian murphy in a lot of moments he looks like killian murphy he also looks like andrew scott mm-hmm. and listeners at home uh you're probably not gonna have any frame reference for this but he looks a lot like taylor friend of the show taylor <laughs> yes like, that's what i was yeah, about to he, say <laughs> So that's why he, for all those reasons, and especially that last one, he is my pick for 84 Hot Boys. Well, that last reason definitely DQs him. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Mike. I think we got to go with Prince. Um, Mike gets the point there. Just sex on wheels on feet in shoes. <laughs> Okay, Mike, who do you got? Look, I know cops aren't sexy, and we're going to have to wrestle that when we get to this episode, but in 1984, a young comedian playing one Axel Foley it might be the one year Eddie Murphy was hot. I this is I think this is a, a great choice, Mike. I mean, obviously you're wrong and you should lose. But <laughs> I don't think Eddie Murphy gets enough credit for how incredibly handsome in the eighties. I especially. remember when we did Yeah, remember we did the uh, what forty eight hours? Yeah. Man, he is such a good looking well, guy. Put me next to Nick Nolte and <laughs> people are gonna be like, damn, that guy's handsome. Um all right, when you brought up 84 cop. I thought for sure you're going to say Judge Reinhold. From <laughs> Judge <Reinhold's> Reinhold. <laughs> and you would have got the bonus points, obviously, if you said that. Um, but I am going to move. This means I only have one spot left. Uh, I'm going to move Estevez over there. I just, Woo. I was astonished by everyone's that I know's reaction to him. Yeah. And the fact that he does change his last name so we don't have to put like a sheen in there. Yes. That's awesome. Yes. And that's changed his last name. name or kept his last name? He kept it, right? He kept didn't it. change yeah. his last yeah. name. Yeah. Or kept his mom's maiden name. Whatever. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. His name's Estevez. <laughs> uh, so I've got one spot open, guys. I want to hear one more from each of you. Greg, what do you got? Okay. Um, I don't think this movie made our cut, but I think it was important to 84. Uh, what do you do when you just dance is in your soul, but it's outlawed in your town? If you're Kevin Bacon, you go to the old foundry and you fucking dance your way through it, Ryan. You dance all day long. Until you're covered in sweat, and then you smoke a cigarette. Until you dance so hard that your ankles get weak and your foot comes loose. <laughs> you dance so hard that you become three different dancers over the course of the routine. That's hard. One yeah. of them, Jennifer Beals from Flashdance. He became. 
Uh, that's a pretty good one, Mike. What do you got? This is, uh, again, specifically about the boy of Hot Boys. And I know he's a piece of shit now, but maybe he wasn't then. And he was such a little 84 Bill dreamboat. Cosby. It was he was rocking those <laughs> sweaters, uh, trying to avoid Freddy, but he couldn't. It's Johnny Depp, little baby Johnny Depp in Nightmare on Elm Street. Wow. I just, you know, I care about women so much. Right yeah. Now, Greg. Sign off Fuck you that. too, Greg. I'm going to give you a point for that. Yeah. Uh, I can't take points away from Mike, but... Give Greg, give Greg a couple of bonus points. <laughs> Make sure everybody knows. Okay, <laughs> act points. like nobody he wasn't got- hot in 84, you fucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nobody got the uh, secret Ryan special. That was Jake Ryan from 16 Candles, who Molly Ringwald ends up with at the end of the movie. Handsome face, Meh. great last name. Well, wow. 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 Uh, but he looks I like a lesser Brandon to. Ralph. That's still fucking hot, dude. <laughs> um, I think that I'm going to have to give this to the reason for Great. the season. It's David Byrne. Let's Boom. just do it. Burn, baby, burn. Damn, I got, I got burned. My little ass got burned. You got shellax. <laughs> Chap little hiney. Uh, your 1984 hot boy mountain. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Name TBD. We might have to switch that one out. I can't believe there wasn't a movie in 1984 called Hot, hot Boy, Boy Mountain. Mountain. <laughs> Escape Summer from Hot Boy Mountain. Hot Boy Mountain. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> the faces on your Hot Boy Mountain are Harrison Ford, Prince, Emilio Estevez, and David Byrne, just like Mommy wanted it to be. When we come back, more Talking Heads. What a year. Burning down the house. Robert De Niro, Bill Murray, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Steve Martin, Eddie Murphy, Freddy Krueger, Zach Galligan. <laughs> the 1984 season of Movie of the Year is not lacking for undeniable male movie stars. Is it possible that Byrne is the starriest of them all? Just a, a, a full master of that stage. And while it, it's overflowing with talent and everybody has their moments to shine, if there's one person that the whole night hinges on, Mike. it's David Byrne, right? And it is that... He everybody looks like they're having fun and he's stoke cold serious, but because he's playing a serial killer singer the whole show. And then <laughs> when he does start to smile, it's like the fucking sun shines on you. Because even he can't hold that character because it's such a blast to be up there. I was gonna say, uh, in the Rushmore, uh, I went on the Stop Making Sense Letterbox page and every single review was like because you know, like Letterbox they sort of elevate themselves they think yeah. that they're very smart and blah 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 every review was like fucking fuck me david Byrne. <laughs> oh god please. that's all i could think please oh. fucking put it in me but somebody <laughs> else on i saw on letterbox say that the best parts of the movie is when that he can't help but crack a smile yeah and then it's a charm overload when he it, he it, doesn't say that much in between songs um but there is a part in between two of the songs where he goes does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Every time Great. I watch this movie, that's the hardest I've laughed at a movie yes. in so long. <laughs> like so funny. That is such a perfect joke. Like, does anybody have any questions? And then they just roll right into the next song. He, uh, I've seen so many bands in my life where the lead singer just stands there. Yes. And it's like, well, what do you do? Right? Like, what is one supposed to do? And I, so you're very sympathetic. Well, I don't know what you would do up there. He finds something to do every second. If that includes running laps. Yes. Dude, he's going to run some laps. It's, it's in once in a lifetime, it's a nonstop wall of sound of lyrics. Like, how could you hold your breath? And so he also adds jogging throughout it. Like, oh, you thought (laughs) I could get tired? And that's why they have to Tom Top Club. It's not just so he can get the big suit. Bro needs to sit down for three minutes. (laughs) They have to Tom Tom Club. Also, also, like you are so grateful when they leave the Tom Tom Club part that you're just like you, you thought. Okay, you liked... so you made a noise earlier. You're not a Tom Tom. Yeah. Fan? Uh, no, not not at all. I, I I do not know why, but I took a dislike to this drubber. Yes, dude. Yeah, and and like I'm sorry, sir. Like, Is he I, a shoe in for biggest shit? I don't. I don't exactly know what you did, but I liked everybody up there on this stage. But for whatever reason, the drummer rubbed me the wrong way, and we'll probably get into that a little bit later. But um, I I was not a huge fan of Tom. Tom. I do agree with you, Mike, that it's like there there is a tree hole in the show where he has to leave the stage for a little bit, and so you have to put something there. But I do feel like that feeling of coming back to the talking heads when he's like, Tom Talk Club's got to go. You're just like, yeah. I so, <laughs> well, I, was watching. <laughs> I, I, ahead, I think having 
Tina Weymouth, because uh, she's been just grooving and like dancing in her little point shoes yes. or boots, depending on the night. Having her take center stage rules and then her interplay with the with Edna and uh, Lynn is amazing. And I don't know, there's something about his like Wall Street guy who learned how to drum douchiness <laughs> that I find very <laughs> interesting. Uh, and the fact that like the camera goes to like when she says your boyfriend and it zooms in on him and my wife turned to me and was like, wait, is the camera telling us he's her boyfriend? I went, he's her husband. Like, I don't know <laughs> all of it. I it's I think why he stands out is not just he's a goober with that like uh, curly haired mullet, but everybody is in gray washed art clothes and he his laundry didn't come back, so he's in his assholey turquoise he's polo, like a shirt. polo shirt. He's <laughs> yeah. Wait, hold on. Is that a joke or is that No, that legit trivia? happened. Uh, four <laughs> days. So for four days, his laundry didn't come well, back? No. Well, once you wear it on the first day, you have oh, to. Yeah. That's not true because everybody else changes outfits, but he's That's the one. <laughs> he decided, well, I did it the first night. I guess I have to all. And everybody else went, no, Chris, we're all changing. You could be in the outfit you, that will match us. And he just never fucking did. This is the ryan shit I've ever heard. It's like, <laughs> well, I didn't do my laundry. So I guess I'm just going to have to wear my regular clothes. To, <laughs> what it sounds like, based on Greg's two things, biggest things about this movie, uh, that the audience of white people is awful and that this guy <laughs> is awful. It, <laughs> do you think that they pulled someone from the audience to play drums? <laughs> I do. I just think he's got a very different vibe than everybody else up there, and maybe it's just the the clothing thing. You know what he reminds me? Remember that show Eastbound and Down? Mm-hmm. He reminds me of his friend Stevie. Great. It's just like he's got like big dork energy. I he, think. I think I'm just, it's obviously not very generous of me to not like him. But he he does have big dork energy, and on top of that, the stuff he says during Tom Tom Club song is insane. There's this. There's this. Whole, and the way he says it, James like, Brown. That, James yeah. Brown, he's the godfather of soul, people. Don't you forget it. Nobody was, Chris. Shut up. <laughs> Should I just, throughout these podcasts, should I just be like, Mark Marin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do wish I was listening to I... that instead of this right now. <laughs> <laughs> you can listen later. Now is movie of the year time. But David Byrne. Uh, yeah, back to David Byrne. <laughs> yes. Um, whether it is running around the stage or his well, uh, I think of this, the original TikTok dance where his knees go back and forth like the <laughs> pendulum of a clock or the big suit or dancing with the lamp. Uh, he found a way to fill every minute yeah. of his stage time well, with something worth looking at. And his eyes, like the way he looks back at the crowd is as engaging as anything yeah. I've seen an artist do. I have a couple questions for you about that particularly. One, what? how much do you guys, based on your impression of watching the movie, how choreographed do you think it was like do you think that he it has because he's the kind of guy mapped out every move or I'll, is he just feeling it i'll say this i think it is very choreographed yes. but does not at all feel choreographed i think he has worked through years of being on stage right. and here's are the different things you can do i mean there there's the music video for the this is not my beautiful wife which i was thinking about it this watching this i think that is the first music video i ever saw really i think like yeah i think that like People would just, if you're my age, you would see that like five times before you even knew there was an MTV. That's how big that video was. But I have to say, I do strongly feel like it's essentially all choreographed. But it has this, or it has this feeling, this energy to it that it's just like we just thought to do this right now. It, and that's I, and because they toured for like a year before on this, right? So they mm. could have the uh, the backup singers in Burn doing the air guitar foot stomp that could have started natural and now it's pinpointed. But I, yeah. I do think that that, that walking that tightrope of every moment is meticulous, especially when you're building a stage. I think you have to know where everybody is. Right. And with that yeah. many people, it's all meticulous, but feels so natural because that's what, what made me angry about so many bands is like, this is showmanship. People put their heart and soul in practice. You're not just bouncing around. You care. Like, fuck punk, new wave rules because they cared about the art of performance again. My and yeah. don't, don't the Talking Heads, didn't, like, isn't their origin story that they were like visual artists who basically Ye- decided to form a band even before they all knew how to play their yeah, instruments? Yeah, they, they met at uh, Rhode Island School of Design, RISD. And where Seth Cohen went? Where Seth Cohen wanted to go. Did he end up there? I don't uh, know if he belonged there. Uh and yeah, so they, they knew each other, and they all knew instruments, and it, it was Chris and David met, and then Tina was like, well, you guys need a bass player. I'll fucking learn. 
And then they met Jerry, who's the multi-instrumentalist. It's like, oh, thank God, a guy who can play everything. Another thing that you really get an impression from this movie, if you don't know anything about the Talking Heads, is this odd tour theory where we have this director who will become an all-timer first ballot of Hall of Famer, right? And then you have all of these incredibly talented people around him, uh, around the lead singer, but it is David Burns everything. This is his mind. And the weirdness of everything is what makes Talking Heads stand out. And it's clearly nobody saying no to him. You know, n- n- not like that, but like there's no notes. There's nobody coming in and sanding off his edges. Yeah. And that is what either makes you terrible or all time. And it's him. And, he, and if you're not willing to like entertain that thin line that separates those two things and really like dance with that devil in the pale moonlight, <laughs> you're not going to make something great. And, right. And that it is why there was tension in the band throughout their career, right? Because well, as amazing it is to watch it, I'm sure to have to interact with that person and be like, I have ideas too. I want to scream James Brown and somebody yeah. say, no, that's stupid, has to get old. How about this? You can do that, but I'm going to walk off stage and you have to say you're a different band while you do it. Well, I think I kind of got my timelines mixed up because I thought that they that Tina and Chris left because of what a piece of shit he was and formed the Tom Tom Club, which is apparently not the case according to this movie. But <laughs> does it change anything for you guys to look back and know what? And he seems to have repented. He yes, seems to he have has. like apologized and taken like charge of the fact that like he was a maniac but well, he was a maniac no because it's 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 ken marino throwing a chair when they're writing state sketches it sucks and it's insane but to get something that great and like that's the line of abuse right it's not throwing the chair at somebody it's not abusing people it is just being militant and kind of shitty but that's i think it is abuse that's abuse yeah. no i mean i i the, he has repented because he was wrong to do it and he recognizes that i feel like Without knowing the story, which I didn't know, if you had asked me watching this movie, is this guy kind of a maniac in the way that he controls this band? I would say yes. I think it comes a it comes across that he must have so much creative energy mixed with so much like we're going to do this my way. Yeah, ego, yeah. Yeah, that like it kind of erases everybody else around him. And I think that things like the chair throwing or all of these stories about all like leaving SA aside, we're just going to talk about you know ego people in charge with egos doing egotistical things that you know to say that it takes a chair thrown to make greatness no they were making greatness and then took advantage of that to throw a chair yeah you have to accommodate this because i'm a genius i get to do this fair i guess but (laughs) that was mike slowly puts the chair (laughs) (laughs) um i uh that being said, this is still this, you know, the, the fact that there is no sexual assault that I know of in his career. Whoop, congrats, yeah, man. Congrats. We're, we're all lucky. One there. of the good ones. Uh, but I don't want to end this segment on that note. Yeah. I want to say that uh, this fucking dork, this guy who probably enjoyed doing math and is probably so in his head that he did have to choreograph it all and then was talented enough to make it seem so natural, absolutely fucking destroys in this show, and because of that, destroys concert films basically for all time. And I, I think his meticulousness is highlighted by it towards the end of the song, or towards the end of the show, Girlfriend is Better, uh, which is where the line Stop Making Sense comes from. He's been dancing off, his running around, every move seems perfect. He misses the mic stand. And yes. you would think a perfectionist <laughs> would freak out. He, he is also just a consummate performer and keeps going. Uh, and then and then slyly picks it up later. But like for Mike. some reason that moment stood out to me. I was like, oh, there's a level of control that's important, and then there's a level of where you're like, I can't control literally everything. Let this moment go. Yeah, we should also point out too that although the big suit is the most iconic part of this, that's wrong. The most iconic part should be when he takes the coat off but has the yes. big pants still on. Yes, that's. <laughs> Man, him moving around with just those big pants so on, goobery. that's worth the price of admission. I'll say that the first time right, we saw this movie, uh, when he came out in a suit, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I guess it's a little big. But it's not It's not cartoonishly big. I don't understand. And so when it, the real big suit came out later, I was, I, I stood up clapping. Fuck yes, this is the big suit. <laughs> Mike, you had told me that story before, and I could not stop thinking of the entire like first half of the movie, just being like, well, I mean, it's yeah, I guess it's a little bigger than you normally see. <laughs> But he comes out in like a 2004 NBA draft class suit. <laughs> oh, <man>. Great. Good <laughs> bull. All right. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, let's talk about something that 
isn't drama for once. Gentlemen, it is that time for Genre Blast where we talk about some of the 1984 movies that are not going to get Academy Awards, maybe not even be talked about by us. Um, the reason for this segment is because it seems like drama gets all the attention and all the awards. There are other genres, though. You fucking elite bastards. You one percenters. You tea party. We need to talk about those movies. I have eight or nine, I think, genres here for you guys to pick from. Hell yeah. We're going to do a little bit of a bracket, a little mini bracket to see what is the greatest blank of that year. But let me tell you guys right up front, right on main, that um, if you ever thought that we d- like make mistakes in picking our Sweet 16, if we like ever get it wrong, we didn't at all. Like We just <laughs> fucking nailed it. All we're, get, the, we're getting pretty good at this. All the Sweet 16 have been taken out of these brackets, and without them, there's nothing left. Uh, Mike, we're going to go have you pick your genre first. Um, your a- options are action, comedy, crime, family. Not crime family. Aww. Like the Biden Not- crime family, Ryan? <laughs> crime, comma, family. Like the Biden crime, comma, family. <laughs> History and war, horror, mystery, thriller, romance, and sci-fi. Oh, man. Just name a genre. I have them all. I know. You how do have fantasy? them all. I am what I am. I'm going to do horror. All right. In horror, your number one seed is Sleepaway Camp. Your number eight seed is Firestarter, who stars that little prodigy, Drew Barrymore. <laughs> Anti-union <Ryan>. agitator, <laughs> Drew Barrymore. <laughs> Do you remember that, America, when uh, like a week before the strike ended, she was like, I'm going to return to my show without any writers? Hey, I had the idea that uh, that I don't need writers. Let me just come out and say it, it probably won't be the number one thing everyone remembers <laughs> about me for the rest of my life. Seeing as how I've had a long and storied career. Have you seen Sleepaway Camp, Mike? Uh, once a long time ago in a bar with a bunch of people yelling at it. So I think I got so it. So no. <laughs> <laughs> Because Firestarter was a much bigger part of my childhood. Same. Uh, re- shit. Okay. Um, yeah, Sleepaway Camp um, has an iconic ending that I've more and more people are just saying it's just the ending, and it's also offensive to right. The 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 movie's mostly forgettable, the and the twist is like, ooh, eighty four did not handle that right. I just I like. I don't know if anybody remembers or cares about Firestarter, but we do have to vote uh, Sleepaway Camp or Firestarter, Greg. What's this twist? Will you tell me how fair? Yes. Then I'll go Sleepaway Camp. <laughs> Mike? No, uh, I, I wish Greg had held true. It's Firestarter. Firestarter fucking ruled, uh, and I loved it as a kid, and I will continue loving it, but never watch it again. <laughs> yeah, Sleepaway Camp moves on. Your next one is Friday the 13th, the final chapter, versus number seven seed, Chud. <laughs> Chud has been so important in so many ways to this podcast and this family <laughs> of podcasts. I think we have to go with that. Because our all of our parents are Chuds. Yeah, because we're, we're the we're the, the children of Chuds. Which is the sequel. And Chud didn't lie to us in its title. The final, come on, fuck off, right at the thirteenth. You're gonna come back yeah, eighteen more times. Get out of here. Get out of here. All right, Chud moves on. Children of the corn. Versus is number three, number seven, is, or eight, seven, number six is The Company of Wolves, which, if you've ever seen this movie or have heard of it, barely fits into this category. This is like a fairy tale, kind of a dark fairy tale that has werewolves, so it's here. But oh. versus Children of the Corn, which is, uh, I think, detrimental to my people, Gingers. Gingers, yeah. yeah. Well, but uh, I feel like Children of the Corn is remembered fondlier than the movie actually performs as a movie but those kids are creepy it's it those kids are creepy and it said said what we would all know 30 years later corn is bad for you (laughs) (laughs) get out of that corn kids all right greg where are we going uh oh what 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 category do i pick no uh children of the corn or (laughs) oh children of the corn corn kids we're doing corn yeah remember that remember that corn kid from tiktok the corn pops jonathan davis he's like he just liked corn oh yeah it's got the juice great song about that yeah dude it's got the juice number four is silent night deadly night maybe the premiere santa's a maniac movie versus the house by the cemetery which i believe is a dario fulci movie that sounds spooky by the cemetery. Ooh. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> spookier in the cemetery. 
Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Now we're starting to really get scared <laughs> into some pretty scary prepositional phrases. <laughs> Lucio Fulci, not Dario Fulci. How about, how about beneath the cemetery? <gasps> that's especially scary. That's, that's where dead people are. <laughs> I don't know anything under. about either of these movies, Ryan, if you can believe it. <laughs> Mike, what do you think? Uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night. Sounds like it's about farts. <laughs> <laughs> Silent but deadly night. Yeah, just throwing that out there. Uh, that's what they called Greg in middle school, but it was like, with a K. Silent but deadly night. I, it was I, was, princesses. I was never silent one time in middle school. <laughs> All right, your number one, your number one seed, Sleepaway Camp versus Silent Night, Deadly Night. I guess I'm gonna say Sleepaway Camp because that I've never even I've only heard of it in the context of you guys talking about it on this show, but it's it sounds like it's got a big twist. Yeah, I want to say on the Gremlin show, Nate brought up something about it, and you were like, "Oh my god, how did you know that?" It's because everybody knows it except for you. Sorry, yeah, you well, I'm, not a, horror movie. I'm not a I am not a horror aficionado. Mike, Sleepaway uh, Camp or Silent Night, Deadly Night? For these two, yes, it's Sleepaway Camp. And Chud versus Children of the Corn. Oh. I would watch that movie. Chud, dude. Yeah, sure. Mike? Chuds for Chuds. Yeah. And then Sleepaway Camp versus Chud. Chud, 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 Chud. Yeah, Chud, 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 Chud. Chud is your 1984 Hell yeah. horror movie. Um, aside from the ones that we're covering on the show. I always got to say that on Genre Blast. All right, Greg, name a genre. Mike was true to himself, so Ryan, I'm going to be true to mine self. Uh, sci fi. All right, your number one seed is Dune. Yeah. Your number eight seed, and this is 1984 is Dune. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, your number eight seed is Electric Dreams. Well, I don't know what that is, but 1984 is Dune is like 70%, 65%, maybe. Good movie. What? Interesting choices. Um, but then there's there's the rest of it. Are electric dreams what android sheep dream of? I do believe that's <laughs> android sheep dream of electric dreams. Uh, do you mean robots? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, electric dreams is about like I think it's like a weird sciencey I want to fuck my computer sort of movie. Who does? Here's here's probably what it is. A computer gets hit by lightning. <laughs> Where would we be without things getting hit by lightning as a way of explaining them? I don't want any more explanation than that. You don't have to bring in a scientist or a priest. Just show me the thing getting hit by lightning, and then you can say whatever happens after that. Well, don't you have to be holding whatever your powers are, though? No, not according to me, dude. Just didn't <laughs> what's his name Ben Flash, Franklin uh, Barry Allen? Oh, Barry. He flew Allen. into like a bunch of chemicals and then got hit by lightning. <laughs> yep, and then had no choice but to become the fastest man on earth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my Dune or Electric Dreams? Dune. Your number two seed, a little bit of a bummer for me that this did not make the Sweet 16, is Starman. John Carpenter's Starman with uh, Jeff Bridges and Karen Allen. Your number seven seed is Dreamscape, which doesn't often get included in the conversation with Indiana Jones and Gremlins as responsible for the PG-13 rating. But probably Ooh. should. I mean, that when you look at Dreamscape, it looks like the cover to an Indiana Jones movie. Right. And I believe, let me check this before I wreck this. Uh, start Kate Capshaw. More Kate Capshaw? I'll yes, sign up please. For that. No, I guess I made that up. Oh, he just made that. Nope, up, she did it. Oh no, nope, he didn't make it up. It's real. We are on a roller coaster right now, audience, and I hope that you are holding on. Dennis Quaid, Max von Sydow, Christopher Plummer, and Kate Capshaw. Damn, Max von Sydow and Christopher Plummer. I know. I they're the same dude. guy. Where's Christopher Lee? <laughs> Is Terrence Stamp not available? Like, why are all those old British guys in there? And what's the other movie? The other movie is Starman. Oh yeah, uh, Starman feels like what, like what you said, like a, a kind of a near miss. Like, if we maybe if we did twenty movies, that would have been on the. The problem with Starman in genre talk as a whole is that like this is a romance drama, but because he comes from space, it makes it's, it sci- it's sci-fi. You yeah. Know? So I don't know if that. Makes you lean e- either way, but Mike, what do you think? Uh, it's Starman. I think it has more cultural cash. Yeah. <laughs> Greg? Yeah, I agree with that, Starman. Uh, your number three seed is Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Your number six seed is The Brother from Another Planet. John Sayles' little scene, but very good movie up with Joe Morton from Terminator 2. Oh, that's who that is. Okay, because I kept seeing the cover of that, and I was like, I recognize this guy, but I don't know like where I recognize him from. 
but yeah, that uh, that is one that pops up a lot when you talk about 1984. But I don't know anything about it besides what the cover looks like, and then right. that guy was in <laughs> that guy was in uh, Terminator Two. But we do know Search for Spock sucks, right? Yeah, I mean, okay, so Search for Spock is one of those, as everybody points out, Star Trek has, like, the even ones are good and the odd ones are bad, I think is what it is. And so one is bad, two is good, and this is three, and three is bad. And it this is not any, like, groundbreaking um, criticism of it, but it takes the central emotional impact of number of two which is spock dying at the end and we all watch it happen and it's built up and it like has like it's such a gut punch and within the title of it (laughs) it lets you know that that was going to be basically retconned and that there will be no permanent death of spock in fact now we are going to go look for the guy boo boo we hate it we hate it so Mike, I I am going to ca- I am going to officially call for this vote. Is it Brother from Another Planet or the Star Trek movie? Yeah, Brother from Another Planet for me. Yeah, I think I'm going to say that too because just nobody likes this Star Trek movie, not even me, the Star Trek guy. So major thumbs down to uh, Search for Spock. Is that Leonard Nimoy starring Leonard Nimoy directed? Yes, it is. Yeah, but to keep him as, like associated with the project, they had to like give him like new powers. And, and the execs that. were like, "But what if he sucks at directing? Well, there's nothing we could do. It's Leonard fucking Nimoy." <laughs> somebody, uh, somebody pointed out recently how funny his line is on uh, The Simpsons, where like they're seeing the eclipse, and he's like, "The solar eclipse." The cosmic ballet continues, and then the guy next to him on the monorail is like, "Does anybody want to switch scenes with me? <laughs> Literally anybody?" <laughs> and you know that's what he was like. All the time. Yes, yeah, because he played a profoundly uh, wise character, and so then he affected that the rest of his career as like, no, that's just who I am. Uh, okay, you're an actor. Don't worry about it. I heard a little bit of a trivia on a podcast I listened to about Zachary Quinto's family. You know what their family crest was and their family nickname was? A Quizno sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> no, Greg. You lose that point, Mike. Volcano. Trivia. Because they were Vulcans and... Nope, just the Vulcans. Oh. They were a family of Vulcans. They oh. worked with steel, and so this was like 300 years ago. Oh, I see. They were known as the Vulcans. Oh, that's cool. Uh, number four him. seed. This battle kind of makes me wish that we were doing more than 16. Your number four seed is 2010, the year we made contact. Yep. Versus your fifth seed, the last Starfighter, which is like that kind of three amigos um, slash Enders game movie where this kid is so good at this video game that was a plant for an alien war. That they brought him up to pilot ships. Yeah, that that's one I definitely am sad that we didn't get to to watch. Uh, what was the other one? 2010. Yeah, 2010. Man, everything you liked about 2001, 2010 shows up to just like kick you nah. in the shins for liking. <laughs> R- rather than be like very artistic and open to interpretation, it's just like okay, here's exactly what was going on in the first movie. Yeah, and here's exactly what's going on <laughs> in this movie. Sometimes sequels can ruin originals. Yeah, 2010 is the perfect movie not to see. <laughs> <laughs> Slap that Pull on quote. the poster. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. 2010 and the Last Starfighter. Well, I can't. I, I mean, I can't go against Greg's witticism, so it's got to be the Last Starfighter. <laughs> Greg, uh, I I agree with me. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dune or Last Starfighter, Greg? Uh, I've never seen the Last Starfighter, and I just recently saw Dune. It's not a perfect movie. It was very interesting. Dune. Your 65 percent of the movie worked is a wild claim. <laughs> <laughs> that is some crazy <laughs> shit. <laughs> I might put everything else I say on this podcast into doubt. (laughs) So much less of the movie works, but that's why I love it. I can't get Cap McCard running into battle with a pug in his hand out of my brain. I fucking love Dune. Hell yeah. And then Mike Starman versus uh, Brother from Another Planet. Uh, Starman. Greg. Starman. And then Greg, Dune, Starman, or Dune? Dune. Wait. Dune. (laughs) Mike, Dune or Starman? Uh, The second Dune. The second Dune? Dune Part 2. Because you said Dune Starman or Dune, so I was saying Oh, this. right, yeah. So you're making fun of me. Being that, about that the thing that was just said, yeah. Greg. Greg, a point real quick. Just get me one of those points real quick. Petty bitch. Uh, 
And Dune is your 1984 sci-fi movie. We have time for one more. Can you two agree on a genre? We have action, comedy, crime, family, history and war, mystery, thriller, and romance. Greg, do you want to do romance or family? Family. (laughs) I did not notice this until the board handed down me this segment. Um, Not only did no animated movies make our sweet 16 no animated movies came out what <laughs> what there is one um uh what do you call it studio ghibli movie nausicaa. from yeah nausicaa but that because of our rules sort of came out in a different year very cool movie though um and so we had no cartoons wow i don't know if that's ever happened i i don't think it's happened since but that's impossible uh this category is amazing let's get it on uh your number one seed is the never ending story your Heck number, yeah. Your number eight seed is The River Rat. What is The River Never Rat? Never ending story, but please tell us about <laughs> River Rat. Of course I will, Greg. Um, it is, of course, the story of a rat on the river. Sure. Take me to, to the, the river. river. Did they sing that in Stop Making Sense? They did, yeah. yeah that's Feed the, me lots of cheese, please. That's the big Billy Mouth Bass song, right? Yeah, dude. That's the one that <laughs> you have a Billy Mouth Bass song sing to you. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones... Martha Plimpton and Brian Dennehy star okay. in a movie about a guy who uh, served some time for a murder he didn't commit. All Billy wants to do is reconnect with his daughter. However, some loose ends, like the whereabouts of his stolen loot, just won't let him go. Okay. Never any story? Yeah, yes. never any story, sure. Your number two seed is The Muppets Take Manhattan. Ooh. Probably the most egregious leave off of our yeah. sweet yeah. again. Versus your number seven seed careful the and what is careful? the movie's called careful the movie is called careful uh and honestly imdb doesn't even know about it so yeah and it's a movie about looking both ways before you cross the street and, and the one mark against muppet takes manhattan uh they did say osama bin laden watched that and that's how he got the plan for 9-11 but we can't really hold that that's against true. the art form yeah that's not their fault because osama bin laden got hit in the head he was an ad exec and then he got right. hit in the head and yes, had amnesia. he totally forgot everything. Uh, your number three seed is Cloak and Dagger. Ooh, Marvel. That movie? great comic. Yeah. Nope. This is with uh, Henry Thomas from E.T. and Dabney Coleman. And then there's like some spy shit. No. Huh. No, nothing. It's going up against <laughs> Farlap. P H A R L A P. The true story of a New Zealand racehorse that becomes a champion with the help of a local stable boy. I, Dude, I, Farlap forever. <laughs> I love that you just started to make up movies to try to slip by us, Ryan. So my vote is also for your fake movie, Farlap. Farlap. It's P-H-A-R, by the way, Mike. No, yeah, that's why I like it's it. It's not even F-A-R. Yeah. Not to keep beating, uh, bringing up this band, but is Farlap your favorite Sum 41 song? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cloak and Dagger always freaked me out as a kid because there was a lady with six fingers. Oof. Ooh, we'll AI. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the new, uh, oh, that was filmed in reverse, is AI. You just scream AI, AI. every time you watch it. <laughs> number four movie, number four seed is Sugar Cane Alley. Mm. Your number five seed is A Sunday in the Country. I only have time to look one of these up, guys. So <laughs> yeah, they both you're... sound delicious. <laughs> they're... Yeah, they're both about dessert, so we like that. Look up Sugar Cane uh, Alley, Ryan. What were yeah. ch- children doing in the 80s? Not going to movies. I guess aerobics. Poking dead animals with sticks. <laughs> Just running in place. Uh, Sugar Cane Alley set in 1931. Sugar Cane Alley paints a rich impasto of native life under French colonial rules. <laughs> uh, I'm Family go gather around the tube. Dessert in the park. <laughs> a Sunday in the country. Yeah. That sounds like the kind of movie that I would call disgusting on this show. <laughs> Sunday in the country, Ryan. All right. Dessert in the park it is. And this is a Sunday like the day of the week, not the ice cream. <laughs> oh, <bucket>. what? <laughs> Lame. Too bad. Uh, all right. Never ending story versus a Sunday in the country. Never ending story, Ryan. Same. M- uh, Muppets take Manhattan versus Farlap. Muppets, Muppets take Ryan. Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, and I guess I could have just said this at the beginning. Yes. Never ending story versus Muppets Take Manhattan. I have to go never ending story because I watched that so much when I was a kid and it made a big impact on me. Uh, I'm going to take Muppets Take Manhattan. Mike takes Muppet Takes Manhattan because the never ending story actually sucks. 
<laughs> and Muppets Take Manhattan is, of course, the winner of the 1984 Greatest Family Movie. When we come back, let's get back into... Stop Making Sense. Former Movie of the Year winner Jonathan Demme directed two movies in 1984 at essentially the same time. Aside from Silence of the Lambs, Stop Making Sense, and 1984's Swing Shift, he also made multiple movies for Roger Corman, including the Women in Jail classic Caged Heat, Spalding Gray monologue movies, Philadelphia, the underrated Manchurian Candidate remake, the overrated Hitchcock knockoff, The Truth About Char Lai, and the all-time classic Rachel Getting Married. So, Taste Buds, I ask you this. I ask you to play our favorite movie of the year game. What the fuck is up with this filmmaker's career? <laughs> As the kids used to say five years ago, I think Demi understands the assignment. He is <laughs> almost journeyman-like, but he can show up and see the genre and do just enough to elevate what the film would be in a lesser director's hands without it, like, our tour theory and being like, oh, you can tell a Demi from a mile away. Great. He stays, at, he stays out of the way. Mike. What, what, but while still making it better than so many other people would. Yeah. Except for, um, except for uh, Silence of the Lambs there. I feel like I, without intending to, avoided this guy's career. You know, you just get that way with the director sometimes. You just haven't seen anything that they've done. Well, especially if you don't have that terminology. Like, uh, the, the new Spielberg is out or the new Hitchcock is out. Yeah. They're, like, right. we didn't grow up in a, in a place where, like, the new Demi was out. And because he does feel like director for hire but he absolutely is not and i want to try and figure out why you mostly using stop making sense as our example but with all of these of like he is not considered to be somebody who you just like you hire at the last minute because you have a green lit script this guy is a master and when we look at these movies but also stop making sense what is it a what are his choices that have you know earned him this reputation I, I didn't know until this week that he did Rachel Getting Married, which is one of my favorite movies, and I see a lot of connective tissue, even though they are 30 years between them, between the style of Rachel Getting Married, even though that is narrative film, and Stop Making Sense, uh, the handheld cameras. It's almost a musical uh, Getting in the film. people's faces, and so much music. Yeah, the music is the yeah. backbone of that movie, for sure. And so I could see him being like, wait, I could take everything I did for Stop Making Sense and do it in one of my little movie-ass movies. And it it works because, as many people have done before, is that handheld, like, faux documentary style makes you feel like you're in the room. And for Stop Making Sense, it means it, it's electric, even if you're in a theater on your couch. Mike. And for Rachel getting married, you want to fucking get out of this me wedding because it's so uncomfortable to be around. Yeah, I mean, right there, we have to, like, I think right up front, and this is one of the easier things to talk about because it's the easiest to notice, is the close-ups, right? Yeah. And I didn't watch any other concert films this week, so I don't have a lot of, to compare to, but I know that the major ones are on a big stage, you know? Like, you, you they most directors in a concert movie want you to feel the bigness of the stage. Yeah, how big the theater right. is, how big the stage is. Right, how important the moment is. Like, just imagine if you were there. And I think that he does away with so much of that. One, basically deleting the audience from the movie um, until the very last seconds, but also the close-ups, you know? And I can't tell, or maybe I have guesses about what was filmed on the night where there was no audience yeah. and yeah. what wasn't, but... The way that he makes us fall in love with all these people is because he he does these close ups of these perfect moments where it's not extreme. You know, we're not we don't feel like we're invading them. We just feel like we're becoming friends with them. We're part of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that he if you watch all of his movies with that in mind, you will see that. I feel like we often when we're talking about directors, we like talk about the shots that they, they select like. But it, it, in this, it almost feels like it's not the shots; it's the it's the the nights that he chose to take for every cut. Like he chose right. very very well when he would move in between the different nights. And I think if you show this to somebody and say, "Did you know this was filmed over multiple nights?" They'll go, "Oh, yeah, I guess it must have been." I mean, logically, I would have thought that, but I didn't. But while you watching. don't feel that at yeah. all, right? Like it does not come across, and you certainly don't think that there's a night where there's no audience i would right. say that that like is completely hidden from from the viewer and so just doing that just achieving that i think is worth something and this is shot in the pantages it could have been shot anywhere but is that where the three of us saw hamilton by the way yes mm -hmm. 
Yeah, all the way in the back. Oh. All the way, <laughs> like, so far. The back is back, back, <laughs> as, back as far back. They built new We seats. were actually in the Schubert Theater. <laughs> <laughs> we were on the other side of the back wall. <laughs> But you know that's a beautiful listening with theater, glasses and... to our ears. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're doing the rap battle. <laughs> oh no, it's intermission. Um, but uh, you know, you don't get the sense for how beautiful the Pantages is, and that's the that's the cost of that human scale. Great. But I do think it is the ri- it's absolutely the right choice, especially when you have people. It, it's more than just David Byrne. All of these people are very engrossing to look at. Yeah, if only because they are, some of them are so clearly zooted out of their <laughs> Oh, minds. yeah. What's up, percussionist Holy Steve moly. Scales? Yeah, dude, that guy is on another planet. What? The, I mean, what percentage of the budget of this movie was cocaine? Cocaine, yeah. cocaine and cocaine accessories? <laughs> <laughs> they had a Hank Hill of cocaine. <laughs> they were all just pressing their face into it. In in the same week, a, a week after I saw this in theaters, I saw the Eras tour in theaters, and yeah, that's oh, a crazy wow. week for you. That's it, interesting. It, it, w- it was a wild week, and so they are always going to be inextricably linked in my head. And while both were phenomenal movie going experiences, I'd say one is art, and one is uh, what Scorsese describes Marvel films as. This is a uh, theme park ride, and. Well, Mike, which is which? You, oh, uh, fuck the talking heads. It's just like it's the Snow White's Dark Ride, right? Uh, the Eras Tour, it, it's 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 a spectacle on every level and, and so much admiration for uh, T-Swift and her entire crew. But at a directing level, that guy just went, oh, is this what you do for a... Like, he had to do zero work because her and her production created this whole thing that they build in real life. So he just went like, yeah, I guess we'll show her climbing uh, the mossy cottage, and then we'll show these girls <laughs> crying. Wait, Barack Obama directed yeah. the movie? Oh, <laughs> uh, can you get out of my shop? <laughs> and, and he did the opposite of uh, Demi, where he, he showed the audience as much as possible to be like, see how important this is, because you can see these people singing along and crying instead of letting the art speak for itself. And, yeah, I think... Even I, I, I'm a T Swift fan, and I think the Airs Tour is phenomenal. But it's just like, how much faith do you have in your musicians and what they can do to your viewing audience? And Demi had a thousand percent faith, Mike. and uh, Joe Schmo Magoo had zero faith in Taylor fucking Swift for some reason. I feel like in the Airs Tour, you feel like you are sitting in the front row. But in Stop Making Sense, it feels like you're standing on the stage. Yeah. You know, it feels like you're jamming with them. And it's got that real jammy feeling to it. And so it they just do accomplish that. Like, you're getting down with this band, and it's more human and real and authentic. Maybe only because they are sweating as much as I've ever seen right. humans sweat in well, my cocaine life. Well, cocaine. Cocaine will make you sweat. Um, there's a couple of quotes that I want to give to you guys. Uh Ebert is famous. One of his famous quotes is that movies are empathy machines. Mm. And I think that Jonathan Demme might embody that more than any other director. That no matter, I I don't give a shit about genre, Mm -hmm. whether it's like mystery thriller or concert doc, which are pretty far apart as far as genres go. Um, I know how these characters feel. And with Silence of the Lambs, like, there are th- the fact that we root for Hannibal Lecter as much as we do is yeah. I think part of his skill. But um, for Demi, I will go back to that scene where Jodie Foster is surrounded by people that are all yes. a foot taller than her, making fun of her that she is a girl essentially, mm-hmm. like that she is a woman. Um, and we all are Jodie Foster in that scene. And here, you know, empathy isn't just about being sad with people, but it's just about like having this experience and knowing what they're our feeling. Our joyous. Yes, exactly. Our joyousness with their joy is what he is capable of doing. And in in Rachel getting married, uh, the scene that I think about all the time and hits this is the Shiva, the destroyer, uh, her maid of honor toast nobody wants her to give. And throughout that scene, (laughs) he transitions to you are feeling uh, everybody else in the room's awkwardness because she's going and then it switches at a certain point and you feel how isolated Mike. She's feeling so. It's almost like, oh, this is what you expected. I'll give you what you think, and and to to be able to understand and switch th- those are very different emotions. But we have such a deft hand at feeling that empathy. I think uh, this Roger Ebert kid might have it. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, Rachel getting married is a perfect example of like, all right, so you have this, it seems fairly low budget movie, right? Very script based, very character based. And you went and got Jonathan Demi, this all timer. Why? And then you hear what Mike just said about like, well, because no one could have done that with that scene. Yeah. No one could have made you feel the awkwardness of the people in the room and the breaking heart live on screen of Anne Hathaway in that scene. Like that, this is what he does. And, you know, when we're watching, we've talked a lot about the fun that they're having, but with, is David Byrne a character? Is there an arc here? Do you feel that there is an arc from minute one to minute 93? Ooh. It's because of the way you said that, Ryan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, just... like, do you think I'm setting up my own monologue that I'm about to deliver? I, I have no further statements, but I just want to say <laughs> definitely I feel like he goes on a journey um, and that he's not the same at the end as, as he is in the beginning. It's. It, it almost feels sketchy to me. He plays different versions of David Byrne. The the starting weirdo of I want to play sketchy is in you. like a skit show. A skit show, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then he's like assaulted by the music, and he has to stop playing. And that's when you're like, oh, this guy is trying to tell us something. And then he has his big suit, and then his like MAGA hat with the big suit later without I know. the jacket. When he put that red hat on, were you guys like, oh, no. no. And then he has his Clark <laughs> Kent glasses during Once in a Lifetime. Like he, and then there's the uh, the very ominous lighting um, during What a Day It Was. And the, like his eyes are barely out of his shadow. Like he is taking on different personas throughout the film. But I don't know if it's an arc versus showing there's, there's no way to capture one singer songwriter or, or a front man of a band. Here's all the different things that make David burn. So not necessarily an arc, but like if you want to get to know him, you have to know all these parts of him maybe. So I cheated, but I'm not competing for points. So it's fine. I read what Demi thought burn was going through the character and what burn thought the David burn character was going through. And I'm going to sort of amalgamate and then call it my own thing. Okay. I love that. Um, that it is a person cracking up and thinking that they are not right for this world. That if you watch the songs in order and specifically watch his dances more than the lyrics, I think that the dances give away more about the arc than the lyrics that he's singing do. Mm. That it's this person who thinks he's not right for the world and has to uh, sort of ostracize himself for the safety of other people, not realizing that because of the staging of the show, more and more people are coming to him and that is making him happier. Fuck. So you you think that you think that like uh, I, I I need to be away from people, but really it's people that you needed the entire time. Mm. And the dances that he does are they go from I feel weird in my body to I feel incredibly comfortable in my body. Yeah, because towards the end he's doing like the wiggle worm behind the microphone stand. And it's no longer like <laughs> awkward robot learning how your knee works. Yeah. And uh, like it's sort of I mean, if you if you just watch the dancing, I think that we can overanalyze or just analyze. We don't have to overanalyze <laughs> each of them. Um, the running in place is just such a cool look, but also very, you know, like you feel like that your life is you just running in place. Like, I think that there's a and lot also of very that 80s, stuff going on. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's when jogging or yogging was <laughs> invented. I think you just go out and run around. Oh, man. Speaking of the 80s, at one point, Tina, I think in the second half of the movie, Tina is now wearing leg warmers. Hell yeah. 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 And and the arm version. Yeah, and the arm version. But there's parts where the camera hits her where it doesn't look like bunched up socks, but just her pants are around her ankles the entire time, <laughs> which is such a decision to make in a big show. They fell, but uh, her hands quote, were around the base. She couldn't pull her pants up. That's true. Dedication. And that's what I love. The other quote I want to read is uh, this. My friend, the director, Jonathan Demi, passed last night. I met Jonathan in the 80s when Talking Heads were touring a show that he would eventually film and turn into Stop Making Sense. I loved his films, Melvin and Howard and Citizen's Band. From those movies alone, one could sense his love of ordinary people. That love surfaces and is manifest over and over throughout his career. And I, I think that there's a thing there of like, I will make movies that have incredible fantastic situations but the people like he's not making movies with the rock and kevin hart right yeah. he's always going to have a very very human center of it all the way up until his culmination of rachel getting married which is the mo one of the most humanistic movies of you know this century yeah i mean um and you can feel that 
in this because there is such a celebration not just of the of the band but there is an evolving relationship with the crowd i would say in this and my my memory of it having seen it one time was that the crowd is almost not shown and that's true at the beginning but then as the movie begins to draw to a conclusion the crowd is like sort of brought into it and we start seeing them a lot more and suddenly they are a lot more active and you realize they are participating more than than maybe you thought in the beginning and the way they're brought into it at the end i feel like is almost like that is like keying in on that human element mm-hmm. you know that like this is a profoundly human experience to watch this show and to enjoy Great. this band and to like follow on this path and so i can see where that where why david byrne would say that because like the scale of this is at times grand and epic, but it's also like entirely human. I mean, can you imagine a situation where David Byrne is very, as, based on what we're, we think, we're not sure, this very calculated, choreographed person watches this movie when it's done and says like, oh my God, I've never, I never knew I was like that. And it's just because of Demi. For and, sure. Like, and he's stoked about it. Like not, yeah. not upset. Like, look at me look at us look at this gets to see a different side of himself look at because you see him connect with the other musicians and dancers and yeah i I think being feeling isolated and then watching yourself do you're like oh i did have a moment where i connected with those people up there and i i feel like i feel like the 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 movie does a good job of showing that like he might be at the center of something but there really is like a community an artistic community around him that like does exist regardless yes. of him. Like, I mean, probably all held in place by him because he seems like the, the, the most... Cult leader. Yeah, the, 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 his, his seems to be the staggering genius. The rest of them seem to be, like, accommodating geniuses. But you do see them together work on these things and develop these things. And the, uh, the movie celebrates everybody in the band in, like, a very democratic way. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. You know what that sound means. Puschettios. <laughs> okay, it said speed round. You might have heard Greg say Pascadios. <laughs> that sound means Greg's we all eat Pascadios. That was actually Greg's tummy that said that. Oh. Uh, it's speed round time, gentlemen. Who's on the most coke on stage? Who's the number one? The 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 guy that's like the jack of all trades and plays a bunch of different y- instruments. Yeah, Steve Scales. Uh, Mike. The yeah, it's he and man, is he having fun? I he's- think. <laughs> He, he's on the fun coke. I think Bernie Worrell, who is a master keyboardist <laughs> on the other side of the stage, is on sleepy coke, and that makes me worried for him. That guy is zonked uh-huh. and sometimes doesn't look like he knows where he is, but Steve Scales is on the best, most fun coke ever. You guys, always choose fun coke if you have the option. <laughs> you please do. Uh, what Mike Ash show references Talking Heads in an episode he watched this week? I guess this is a trivia for Greg. Oh, uh, <laughs> is it like Tattoo parlor <laughs> i'll give you a hint greg ink, it's wait tat it's ink master fuck boy island uh those yes, are my okay. guess shows man i'm embarrassing um no greg <laughs> this is a show that you were like i can't mike how is that and i haven't watched it you were shocked uh because it's so mike ass it's reacher I'm totally it's, start- it's amazon reacher. prime's reacher uh oh, and, reacher the big boy and in season two of reacher which i just finished and it was great uh they get to New York, and one of Reacher's friends, who he has a hard time having friends, like one David Byrne, he's like, we're in New York. we got to play Talking Heads. They're a New York band. And Reacher says, uh, they're a Rhode Island band who moved to New York. Uh, <laughs> Reacher. That's classic it, Reacher. When we, next trivia question. When we do uh, Movie of the Year 2024, is Jack Reacher, that actor, Alan Hitchson, is he a 2024 hot boy? Yeah. He is a wall of man meat. We don't. We usually don't get big boys that big. So yeah. I'm gonna say yes. That would make me happy. We usually do. Spelt little guy. Yeah, we like elfin fade boys. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing I know about movie of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Just three straight guys who definitely have a type of who dude love like. twinks. <laughs> uh, what's the best dance move? And you guys can go group or single. Oh, I'm gonna go TikTok knees. When he does those knees back and forth on either side, man, that's Greg. where I'm like, okay, this guy Greg. It can move very gracefully. Like, I'm going to give Greg two points for that because I don't know if he means TikTok on the app or that his knees TikTok <laughs> like a clock, but I like them both. <laughs> it's, I, I think it's, it's during life during wartime. Uh, he's just, it's that sinuous wiggle right behind the mic stand. And the mic stand splitting his body in half lets you, like, the mirror image of all of his limbs hit even harder. 
Yeah, it's okay. The correct answer is uh, the lamp because that yeah. is the like the key that lets us know that we both burn and Demi want us to know that we're watching a 1930s musical. Mike, when you went to see this, didn't somebody bring the lamp? Uh, everybody brought a lamp. It was like Rocky Horror. They <laughs> threw the lamps at the screen at the end and it ripped the screen. The theater got very mad. <laughs> not every movie needs to be Rocky Horror. Like that should not be a thing to happen. Uh, is there anything wider than the few shots of the crowd where we can clearly see most fans are sitting down? That's yeah, crazy. They, uh, they get up near the end, but there is not a shot of the crowd that doesn't include at least four people just sitting there. What are you doing? This is one of the most what? dancing bands of all yes. time. Get off your ass. <laughs> and they're like all standing in pools of their own sweat from nonstop movement. This is the number one concert movie of all time. And you can see in the crowd in every shot at least four people well, just sort of like kick back. There was one guy towards the back who kept anytime somebody stood up to dance, he would scream, sit down. You're ruining it for the sit rest down. of us. <laughs> Try to see. Um, I did. I listened to an interview with uh, Jonathan Demi and did hear the practical reason for that. Oh no! Because yeah, cameras. It's because if you want the audience to show up on film, then you have to light them, and the only way to light them, they were bright as fuck, and the Talking Heads performed in that situation, and they were petrified the entire time because they could, <laughs> could see, see the face that. of every <laughs> audience member. And Jonathan Demi claims that he is filmed. Maybe this was night one and none of it was used because he claims that he has filmed uh, the worst talking head <laughs> show in the history of time. There is something so comforting to being on stage and you look out and all you yes. can see is this brilliant light yeah. and like everything kind of fades away and maybe you can see like two people. I couldn't imagine standing on stage <laughs> and you can see 2,000 people yeah. just looking at you. Especially if you're in, in your head where we know Burn is, and the other ones probably are also. Anytime somebody leans in to talk to their significant other, they're probably just like, this song's great, but you're going to be like, oh, they caught that, that I was pitchy. And now they're just talking they're about bored. how pitchy I was. <laughs> they hate this. <laughs> they're wondering if the sitter will keep watching the kids at home. <laughs> this is not my beautiful stage. <laughs> great. <laughs> that is speed round. Guys, when we come back, we have to give stop making sense all the awards it deserves and more awards that's right you heard that sound we don't have an, an award sound do we no awards. One, yeah oh that's you heard mike say i that. thought it'd be really cool if a bunch of different people goes like and the award goes to mm. and the award for best whatever but that's hard to do and overlap them that would take yeah. time and yeah, yeah. Like, hey get on that hard. producer can't dude. somebody else do it <laughs> hey uh listeners make us our stuff uh let's start with <laughs> recommendation like what did stop making sense inspire you to recommend uh i i have two so I'll, I'll do my real one and then i'll do my hm um early pandemic a little movie came out on hbo called american utopia and it's directed by friend of the show spike lee and it uh -huh. is uh david if you're burns. in the hall of fame you're a friend of the show yeah you're a friend of the show you hang out uh and it's david burns solo show that was on broadway and Maybe it's because it was peak lockdown, boys, but let me tell you, I watched this concert film and wept. And that was the yeah. first time I was like, oh, a concert film can make me feel things, and not until I watched Stop Making Sense. So it might just be I am up David Byrne's ass, and he is up mine. But I think if you enjoyed Stop Making Sense, <laughs> you should check out uh, the much less seen Spike Lee's American Utopia. It was um, – yeah, it was a big deal for a week because that's how Netflix does. But um... – it showed me a couple things. One, if there's a pandemic on and you watch something, you will weep. It is yeah. not. It doesn't take anything away. <laughs> Look from at this the group of people of together. Incredible. Remember, remember, we watched that movie uh, about the house party in London. Oh all yeah, we talked about was how oh, much we wanted Jesus. to yeah. party. Small acts, small, small acts. Yeah. Uh, the other thing it showed me, looking back on it now, is that uh, Spike Lee, one of our collective favorite directors, it just. Stop Making Sense is such a lightning in a bottle mm -hmm. moment, you know? I do think that American Utopia is great, but Stop Making Sense is otherworldly because yes. this thing happened, you know? Yeah. Not to shit on your rec, Mike. Thanks. Greg, what'd you pick? Uh, I don't watch a bunch of concert movies, and so I was like, oh, I'm not going to have a good recommendation. And I was freaking out. Uh, <laughs> but then I went to Google Hill, and I remembered this one from uh, 2021 by Quest Love. Uh, the Summer of Soul, oh, shit. Um, mm. about the 1969 Harlem Cultural Festival, which was like six weeks, uh, where basically if you were a black artist, you showed up and played this show. And like 
hundred thousand people showed up. Some uh, some absolutely bonkers amount of of people showed up. Um, like sitting in trees on top of cars, on top of buildings, and uh, it's just a beautifully, uh, wonderfully shot documentary. And the talent is just. I have to read off some of the names because it's uh, it's it's almost Nina a little bit hard to believe. Uh, Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone, Sly and the Family Stone, Gladys Knight, and the Pips, um, and more. And oh, the Pips showed up. It was. <laughs> yeah, Gladys, Gladys Knight was there, and they came running on the stage at the last second. She was like, "I thought you guys would show up," and they were like, "Yeah, you know." They what. parachuted in. <laughs> uh, but yeah, great movie, great fun, and all like the, just like this, like uh, the songs when they play in this documentary. You like you're moving, you yeah. Know? You get up and yeah, you feel it. The music gets around to your bones. There's also this other thing too, which Demi and Byrne did not choose to do with this, um, but was more like, uh, th- let's say Woodstock. If we're talking about concert docs, of talking to the people about where they're at in that yeah. moment and talking about how like, oh, that's cool. Um, America can send a man to space, but cannot feed the people its citizens. You know. Uh, and that- I like one thing I have to point out because it was it struck me as kind of funny. Like obviously Mexican style clothing was having like a moment in black fashion at that time, and I don't feel like there's that people ever talk about that. So just to see what people were really wearing mm. in uh, 1969 and the the way like the world really was, and not like our distorted memory of it, I thought was kind of cool. Do you guys remember Questlove's uh, Oscar acceptance speech? I don't. Uh, he had a lot of things to say, but nobody paid attention because everyone was reeling <laughs> after Will Smith just smacked the oh, shit out of yeah. Slap <laughs> heard around the world. Oh, and he was just like, please, people, can we just not... Fo- can we focus on black love instead of black this hate? This is probably Which, the yeah. only time I'm going to get to do this. Oh, well. That, it's such a bummer. Uh, my recommendation is not a perfect film. Uh, but it is True Stories, directed by one David Byrne, which came out, I think, a year after this one. Um, what a wild movie. It's a little bit Cohen esque although David Byrne is just in this movie through and through. Uh, wrote it, directed it, and stars in it. As a guy who is traveling to a small, I want to say Texas town for its, like, sesquicentennial or whatever towns have. Uh, and it's basically just, like, here's all the characters I met. And they're all, like, you get such a deeper dive into David Byrne by watching this movie. Um, because it's so sketchy as mike would say not like it steals your money but <laughs> it's skit showy um it has its ups and downs you know like yeah the batting average isn't great but the scenes that work are so amazing uh specifically spalding gray scene spalding gray's dinner scene uh it just i would just look that clip up on youtube and if you like that then watch the movie uh let's give greg. that point to greg thank you Oh, my HM. Uh, let's, uh, if, if listeners oh, yeah. want to get more into Talking Heads. Uh, what, what finally broke it from being a band I sort of knew about to deep diving, and uh, we don't often talk about other podcasts in the show, but it is one of my favorites. It is You Talking Talking Heads to My Talking Head. Mike. And <laughs> Scott and Scott uh, seated and flowered the my love of this band because they are such passionate fucking dorks. And just a great album by album uh, replay of the band. I asked my wife before I watched this if she wanted to watch it with me, and she was like, hell yeah. And when she said that, I said, are you talking head, uh, talking heads to my talking head? And she looked at me. She stopped. She's not a fan of these shows. And she was <laughs> like, is that a fucking Scott and Scott <laughs> title? And I was like, yes, yeah, yes, it is. We are three married gentlemen with, with a few podcasts b- between us. Um, none of our wives oh. care, care for podcasts or us at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they think we're absolute dullards. Let's go to um, usually pound for pound performance is the obvious slam dunk. Um, might be tonight, but this one might be even more. Let's go to eighty four fashion. Mike, is this obvious or do you have something else? Uh, I I'm I have one specific, and we've already talked about it. It is Tina Weymouth's second outfit. She's in the mini dress with the leg warmers and one arm warmer. Uh, all gray because they're all in all gray. But that that is eighties as shit. And nothing else in this movie is as 80s as that. See, I thought that Jerry Harrison was so much more of a dork than Chris this whole movie. When they come back in the gray and he's wearing like a fleece, like an yeah. old maybe fleece, he's he's a fucking dumbo. <laughs> <laughs> but Terry, uh, 
Tina is amazing in that part. Greg, what do you got? Honestly, I had the same one. <laughs> uh, I love that outfit. I thought it was so cool. She Loki like steals the movie. Yeah. Because David Byrne, you you realize you're supposed to be looking at him. Obviously, you love looking at him. She comes on stage and you're like, oh, she's so sweet, but she doesn't move as much as he does. By the by the halfway point of the movie, you're like, wait, I'm looking at her most yeah. of the time. Like, um, and she gets into it more and more as it goes by, and she like seems to, I don't know, have more fun with it uh, as as the show goes on, and and you're right there with her. And then yeah, this outfit is just it's very fun, it's very eighties. And leg warmers came back, I feel like in like 2014 or something, and I wish they would come back again. I think that's such a fun. My fashion. legs are cold, bro. Yeah, you know, and and they the the like she her version of like the Ray <laughs> arm wraps. Yeah, uh, very cool looking. All in all, just a, a a great outfit. My honorable mention would go to the um absolutely terrible outfit the backup dance the backup singers wear oh, the they're both so gorgeous <laughs> yeah they they those are the worst outfits i've ever seen in my life on two of the most beautiful women of all time <laughs> and the women elevate the outfits to such a degree that it's ridiculous because it is a crime they look like something you buy at a costco <laughs> like and you get like multiple ones in a bag they're like jersey material it's a crime <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, Mike. I guess I will give that to Mike because he said it first. Uh, no mention of the big suit in the 84 Fashion Award. Nice job, gentlemen. Musical moment. We added this award for the 84 season. Didn't know it would hit so hard with this movie. Greg, can you even pick one? Uh, I think for me, it has to be Psycho Killer. Uh, I just I find that song so fun. And him just up there with like <laughs> the tape player. Uh, and playing that song, very it's just a good a good moment, and I felt like right at that moment, like we're ready to go. You know, like I feel like I'm in good hands, um, and I'm ready to go on this journey. Do you guys wish they reversed the order that they came out, and it was Chris first, and he just <laughs> drummed a song? <laughs> <laughs> he listened to a song and then drummed it. Uh, Mike, what do you got? Uh, it is for for me. It was the one like if you listen to the album, it sticks out, and then in here, it did even more so. It's a uh, the fifth song is called "Slippery People," and then there's a refrain, but it's the very end where everything cuts out but the acapella singing and our dork Chris, and so he's just <laughs> slamming on the toms, and it's everybody in like harmony saying all right drums the lord won't mind drums and it just the way it all stops and makes you focus in on what's happening is fucking sick i never put together where that band got their name but chris was probably drumming on his toms and he was like the tom tom <laughs> club yep <laughs> yeah like that's uh i'm gonna give you a little bit Mike. extra juice because you picked such a specific moment but man is it possible that one movie has all, all of them. five nominees. Yes. Yeah. It is very possible. Uh, let's go to cringiest moment, Mike. It's, I, I, I don't, this one was, it, this is the hardest cringe in the history of movie of the year for me because watching it wasn't it, but it has to, if we, we've talked about it throughout the whole show, going back to our good friend Chris, uh, him just, his, Tina can sing in a very unique way and his weird yes. stripper DJ voice cutting through. Uh, and it's not James Brown. For me, it was, uh, ooh, nasty love. And he goes, women can do it too, guys. Uh, fuck yeah. this guy. Yeah. I'll, I'll go with the, his whole thing for me, definitely. And also, like, I did, like, hey, what kind of voice is that that you're doing, bud? Like, what would you say? Like, where? Yeah. Well, like, who? What type of person would you say you're, like, doing an impression? <laughs> or any of well, the other musicians on stage? Yeah, like, like um... could you point to somebody and... Uh, but I'm going to go with the... something else, which is uh, I I am going to go with this moment that if you ever have worked with a microphone, um, when you watch microphones in movies and stuff, people just like chucking them around and like, <laughs> but when somebody hands you an actual microphone, they're like, don't bump this on anything. <laughs> don't uh, put this too close to your wide open mouth. Uh, don't hit any part of this in any way. There's crystals in here. And then you go to like to do the mic test thing where you blow and they're like, do not fucking blow in the mic. That's not good for the crystals. When <laughs> David Byrne goes to put the mic in the mic stand and just, boy, <laughs> he, he whiffs. Like that's <laughs> not where, no, you didn't do it, man. You didn't slide it in there. Uh, and drops it from like six feet up and it hits the ground. Just from working with mics, the little <laughs> bit I have in my life. A literal full body cr cringe when that happened. Great. Oh yeah. Uh, 
And yet, Greg, you are the one most responsible for breaking the most amount of mics that's, in the studio. I definitely think that's And true. it's because after every show, you treat them like a guitar and you yeah, smash, just them, smash on the them on the table. Uh, I'm going to give that one to Greg. Just because crystals, crystals and mics, that's Man, yeah. it's such a good concept. Uh, let's go to pound for pound performance. Greg, who stole this show? I don't, I'm not going to give you the name I have written on my sheet here, Ryan. <laughs> Because when I really think of what the ethos behind Pound for Pound is, obviously the biggest performer is David Byrne. Um, clearly he used to be bigger if you look at the size of that suit. Um, <laughs> oh, you think it's a good for him. situation? Good for him. Jared, a Jared Fogel situation. Good for him. Um, but I have to go with the bass player. She's so captivating. Uh, she's so talented. Uh, she's so pretty. She's uh, adorable when she's having fun. The, uh, like the fact that she's never, I can't even think of the word, but never trying to get the yes, camera, you know, mm. like never like trying to upstage anyone. I'm just gonna fucking play my little bass, yeah, and dance like it's making me move, and the camera will find me. Yeah, like she doesn't fake it. It's not, until she feels it, she doesn't do any. She doesn't do a lot. But man, the, like one song into it, she's like caught up in the storm, and like. We are on the same journey she is on, more than we are on the same journey David Byrne is on. And to put on top of that, as far as we know, this band was on the verge of breaking apart. She probably she might have hated that dude and still <laughs> like looked at him with love yep. and smiles. Uh, all right, Mike, what do you got? Uh, talking about love and smiles. Yeah, it should just be presented by David Byrne, right? Because that's obvious. But for me, it was uh, who I found captivating and like elevated the whole stage. And every other musician who gets to interact with them because they can move around does. It's Lynn Mabry and Edna Holt split this for me. Mm. Uh, they having if if you cut these two out, there's so much sonically that goes away without the counterbalance to yeah. Byrne's weird multitude of voices, and and they're more like angelic choir voices and and they are so happy and into every moment being up there and it is hard not to watch them does it ruin the movie for you guys that one of them did backups backstage before they were introduced so it was supposed to be like yeah. two or three people yeah. out there but there was actually somebody yeah. else that that is so as i referenced earlier really right? a green day fucking move <laughs> they're yeah. so the the they're so tight too like mm -hmm. uh with each other and with Locked him in. like they really manage to move as like one unit yeah i do think that they are the uh beating heart of this show as much as i love tina and as much as like i was mike. fixated with her it's it's the ladies give that one to mike uh director signature moment we had a whole segment i don't know if that changes your guys's picks but we talked about demi like what is the demiest thing you saw here mike it is um it only solidified it. It so in the bridge of burning down the house, the camera loses burn for a second. Like he dances too fast and then it searches <laughs> for him. It's looking and then goes down. He's like bent in half dancing. And it reminded me so much of uh the scary scene where we're seeing from Buffalo Bill's point of view in Sons of the Lambs, or so much of Rachel getting married, where the, the camera is tracking the action, not the other way around. And that is that is, I think, uh, Demi's one of his, and we talked about so much of him, but one of his superpowers is like, okay, I can follow a beat behind where the action is instead of guiding the crowd. I will also uh, be in the point of view of the viewer and chase what's going on. Which gives you like, uh, it It just shows, like it puts you there more. Yes. You know, it's like this, it, it gives you more of this docudrama f feel. Um, and it's just like finding the moment. I'm gonna let my characters do their thing, and then I'll get what I can. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a such a good one. Greg, what do you got? Uh, for me, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is um, he does not show the crowd at all at first. It's very tight up on the stage, and then the crowd like starts to be on the sides of, of certain shots, and you almost feel like, oh, I, I wonder if he like accidentally caught some of the crowd there <laughs> and then as but as the elements are being introduced to the show you realize near the end the last element introduced to the show is the crowd mm -hmm. and the shots open up to the entire crowd and at this point they're engaged maybe not every single person right but they are pretty engaged and you start seeing like okay now we have seen the people producing this music and the effect it has on them but then the crowd shots remind us that like this is a even a more plural experience than just the people on that stage. And like 
we uh, maybe this is too much to say but like we are kind of brought into it at the end like we are part of that right and that is like ultimately we come in at the end almost like this is not avengers endgame this is not gods on stage yeah but like this is these are humans and humans got to see it just to like ground the movie a little bit more and you like the mastery of that is you don't anticipate that with the initial shots. You feel like you understand the movie, even as you're watching it evolve, but you don't think it's going to evolve in that way. And when it does, it's so joyous. It really, like, those are some of the most joyful moments. It, you know, if our producer... Go ahead, Mike. I was going to say, especially at the end, we, we, uh, we see the most crowd we're diving, we're almost walking through them. It's uh, the last song, Cross Out of Painless, and it's the repetition of them saying, still waiting, still waiting. But we're like, yes. That now we see the people who have been waiting, or are we waiting to see them? It's, I don't have a cogent thought about it. It's just there's something with that repeated line and finally seeing the people mixed together. I it reminded know. me of the Lawrence For- Ferlinghetti poem, you know, I am waiting. Like you said, I, I am eternally waiting for a return to wonder. Like it, it seemed to invoke that, you know, that idea of like waiting for that return to magic and to wonder and to magistry and to, you know, wake up into like the fullness of what we are. And that's also what's happening on the screen. If our producers had done their job, we would have had an interview tonight with somebody from the audience who looked like they weren't having a good time. And just to be like, <laughs> what was up with you? And they could have been like, I had a bad day. Or just like, mm, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it. You know, I do not care for live music. <laughs> I got dragged there. I have there. season tickets to the Pantages. I did not know <laughs> what this was. Uh, those Mike. are both incredible. But yeah, I, Mike's just sort of sums up everything that I think about Demi. So I'm going to give it to him. Uh, when we come back, we're going to see who won this dang old game show and talk about what's coming up next. Mike, I miss you, buddy. I feel I, like we haven't hung out in a long time. Not seeing you guys is strange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you're still there, but. Nah, it's I got cool a that voice you're naked double. Now. Oh, yeah, I got hot. <laughs> Just waving your wiener. Are you tubing right now? Oh, oh we're going tubing. You tubing. <laughs> All right, ready? Yep. Yes. Recording in three, or clapping in three, two, one. <laughs> Gentlemen, you both fought well. I think that we did, you two did your best at um, trying to talk about a movie that isn't like our typical movie. Uh, we probably cracked it open better than anybody, including Demi and Byrne has, yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Indubitably. Eat our dust, Demi and Byrne. But one of you did it better. Uh, Greg, you had 23 points. Oh, wow. That's not that's not a lot. You had 46 points. Is that better? I'll just double them. Okay, yeah. I can't, I can't deny that literally <laughs> that made me feel better. Like, that's so dumb, obviously. Your point is very well taken. But I cannot deny that I instantly felt better. Mike, you had 44 points. Greg took it down by two. But oh. Damn. <laughs> yeah, For I a was second, like, I thought you beat me. By- so did I. <laughs> I was like, whoa. I would have cried. I would have cried. That would have been so upsetting to me. That would have been an all-time drubbing. That would have been a run by fruiting. But no, uh, 46 to 44, damn. Greg, is our final score. Ooh. It was so close. Um, guys, This, like, can this movie go all the way? Yes. Is it even possible? Shut up, yes. No. No. <laughs> No, I, that, I maybe we should like we don't tend to say this kind of thing right off the bat, but maybe that would have been an interesting thing to say. Right, like I think it's got no chance. I loved it. I'm so glad we did it. I'm so glad we couldn't have had the season without it. All that other stuff we say when a movie doesn't have a chance. This movie has no. I chance. mean, have we watched a better movie so far this season? No, not yeah, that's Ghost, Ghostbusters is better than this. You're no. wrong as hell. Yeah. I don't Gregory. think we've watched a better movie in the entire run of movie of the year. That's what you said about you Once Upon a Time in America, too. You everything, Mike. I'm enthusiastic. That's what, you, <laughs> that's what you said about Stuart Little, too. Our most argumentative episode. Well, then I might need to change my 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 idea, because the way this works is we vote, the three of us. Yeah. And if two people say yes, uh, then yes, Ryan, I think this could do it. This show is the only democracy left in America, and that means that it could move on. Besides just absolutely owning the Music Moment Movie of the Year award, what else could this Maybe get not uh, duos. I, this duos. Has got like several duos that could win. Yeah. It, yeah. 
Chris in uh, his jacket. Biggest shithead. <laughs> shithead. We all learned. <laughs> yeah, dude. We all found that out together. <laughs> Director. What if people write in and say that Greg is the biggest shithead for not liking Chris? Uh, you know what I'll do? I will reflect on what I've done and try to be better. You know what? Eat that. Like, Greg. <laughs> come at me, idiots. <laughs> right, Greg, another point for that one. <laughs> I'll just grow, man. I don't give a fuck, right? <laughs> oh, he's Whatever scary. it takes. <laughs> thank both of you so much for being here. Also, thank uh, David Byrne and all the talking heads, Jonathan Demi, for everything that you've done. Everybody in the audience who stood up, we thank you. Yes. Everybody who sat down. Go fuck yourself. Yeah, dude. Sit at home and watch fucking Jeopardy, idiots. Uh, coming up on Movie of the Year, we have got so many exciting things. Buckaroo Banzai is coming, guys. The Karate Kid, Paris, Texas, Film Spotting's Adam Kepinar, and Screen Crush's Matt Singer. So much to be excited for, so please subscribe, rate, and review. And as always, keep watching those movies. I feel incredibly comfortable in my body.